what we're going to do is uh, let's open our Bibles. We're going to be second in Second Samuel, chapter five, and we'll look at uh, verse seventeen all the way down, right to the end of the chapter. Okay, and we're going to be looking at the testing of David. Okay, now just a very quick recap. Last week, as we dealt with the previous uh, okay lesson in in chapter five. We, we saw how the tribes came together, and this was for the purpose of the coronation of David. Now, this they came together, they're going to anoint him, make him king over all of Israel. Okay, and so they came and they claimed, okay, we're, we're your, you know, flesh and bones, we are brethren, we're part of you, you know, and, and so basically, let's not fight, all right? Let's, and, and so they chose to unite. Now, I think it's interesting that when you look at this issue of unity, there is a decision and a choice. Okay, there, um, the, these, all these different tribes also agreed, right? They made a conscious choice and decision that we want to put aside the differences. Okay, and very often, I think what you see when you look at any organization or group of people, okay, and in particular, including a New Testament church, right? Or even in the case of a family or a marriage. Now, we have to ask ourselves some very important questions in that are the differences there to build us up to complement one another, right? Which therefore makes us stronger or are the differences there because these are going to be the uh, flash points, all these areas where we are going to experience conflict, right? Where we're going to amplify um, the areas of where the differences become irritations instead of uh, celebrating that, you know, it, the differences are complementary. They actually build us up, they make us stronger, right? Uh, the, okay, the whole, right? The sum of the whole is actually larger as a result. Now, they decided that they are going to come to David, all right? And they're going to ask him to okay, be their captain, all right? And they acknowledge, right, that the Lord actually said to him, all right, to feed his, children, uh, his people, Israel. So they made a league with him. There is an alliance. There is an agreement, right? Uh, that they're not going to fight. They're not going to uh, get into aggression. And then David was 30 years old when he took over, right? And, and then he reigned for another 40 years, well into his 70s. And in this chapter is where we see he makes Jerusalem, right, his capital. Now he goes to... So he sends his men over to Jerusalem, right? And then they basically insulted him. They said, you know, um, you're not going to come in. You're not going to conquer us, right? Verse 6. Uh, unless you, know, you can defeat the lame and the blind, right? Basically, they're thinking there's no way that David can come in here. Now, here's the thing. We need to realize that where God is with us, okay? And where we, you and I are in the will of God we are going to be, right, invincible. It doesn't matter whether it's, uh, whether we don't have numbers, you know, on our side, whether we do not have the benefit of a large budget, right? All those things don't matter. And you're going to see David and his men were actually despised by the Jebusites. They were very confident, right? They, they thought, okay, they're safe within the, uh, the very high walls of their city, right? They're going to be able to sit this thing out for a very long time. And there's nothing that David is going to be able to do. But then verse 7 tells us, nevertheless, David took the stronghold, Zion, right? The same is the city of David. So now it establishes um, that from this point forward, okay, this city is going to be known as the city of David. It's going to be very intimately tied to his name, right? And it's going to be the new capital. And it's significant because this is going to be the city, right? That down the road, the new temple, right? Temple of God is going to be built there. In fact, there are going to be three temples built there, right? The first two were built. They were destroyed. There is, okay, the Bible prophesies that there is going to be one more, right? It's not built yet even in our day, right? Because there is currently a mosque that's sitting there, 
And this is a, going to be a very important city throughout the whole of human history. And even to today, a very highly contended city, right? It is divided the entire world, uh, even right at the United Nations. And so David, right, sets forth this challenge, right? Whosoever will get up to the city, will smite the Jebusites and take it. He's going to be the chief and captain of his people. And, and so this was done and David established this, right? Uh, he moved in, he set it up, right? Built up the fort, right? And, uh, and so on and so forth. And then you're going to see that God gave favor, right? The Lord of hosts was with, with him in verse 10. Um, other kings like Hiram, king of Tyre, right? Acknowledge the, that God was with him. Uh, God gave favor. And then he sent, you know, uh, a lot of resources, men, manpower, talent, and, you know, a, a, a exquisite, a beautiful palace was built for David. And so David recognized and realized that God established him as king over Israel, right? And that he, his kingdom was exalted for one reason only. Right, for God's sake, for the people of Israel's sake, not for himself. Now, David was very clear. He did not allow this to get into his head. Right now, you contrast this to in the book of Daniel, you see Nebuchadnezzar. One day he strolls into his palace, he looks around and says, Wow, I made all this. All this is because of me. <clears throat> and immediately the Lord struck him. Uh, for over about a year or so, you know, he, he lived and became like an animal, right? And, God, and, and at the end of the period, God, Nebuchadnezzar acknowledged, right? God is sovereign. God is king. God can, you know, raise someone up, okay? By his permissive will, he can also bring someone down. Now, David recognized, you know, all this came from God. Okay, now, nine is well and fine. Except that when you get to verse 13, you're going to see that that one, uh, one area of his life where it was, he was not fully surrendered, right? Where God didn't have control over his life. Okay, remember, David allowed God to rule in his life. No doubt about that. But realize this. This is true of David. It's true of all of us. Just because we, uh, we surrender and we allow God to rule in our lives, you know, that Christ is our Lord, our King, and our Master. No, the reality is, for most of us, it's not going to be in 100% in every area of our life. Right? And in one area here, and, and that, by the way, that's something of a progressive work. God has to keep uh, working on us, dealing with us, right, for, in order for that to happen. Now, in the in the, with, the, with respect to David, now verse 13, you see that he added more and more wives. Okay, and that's one of the areas that David never fully surrendered to the Lord. And you're going to see, realize this here is that these areas and these things where it's not surrendered fully to the Lord, all right, if we allow it to continue to fester, to grow, it's going to come back and bite us one day. Okay, and, and all these wives, you know, they, with, with that came all these um, children, right? David's family grew larger and larger, and it led to problems. And, and not only that, but it wasn't just about wives. David had an issue with women. Okay, and as godly as a king that he is, right? And as a man of the God's own heart, this was one area that God never was never allowed to rule over his life. And it came back to bite him in a very big way. Now, we're going to move on. We're in verse uh, 17. Okay? And we see the testing of David. Now, verse 17, it says here, um, beginning with this, we see the assembly of the Philistines. Okay? Now, here it says, but when the Philistines heard, right, that they had anointed David king over Israel, all the Philistines came up to seek David, and David heard of it and went down to the hole, right? And the Philistines also came and spread themselves in the valley of Rephaim. Now, here David, right, finds himself 
facing the Philistines in battle. Okay? His ability to rule and to lead Israel is going to now be challenged. Right? They spread themselves as a very large group. A okay? very large group came for David. Now, and here we see in uh, verse 17, and David heard of it, right? They heard that he was anointed king over Israel. Now, all, not just a few cities, right? Now, the Philistines were broken into different city-states. All the Philistines united, right? They came after David, and David had to actually go into a defensive position. He says, David heard of it and went down to the hole. So the idea here was that he went into a stronghold, a fortress, right? He was forced into a defensive posture. Now, possibly to be in a siege and to sit this out, right? Now, and so here the Philistines came, notice, and they spread themselves in the valley of Rephraim. So what we see here is that this is going likely to be a very long, right? A very prolonged fight. Okay? And... The question will be, how is this going to go right, for David now? And David, verse 19, okay, uh, sorry, um, let me back up a bit. Um, okay, we, let's take a look at First Chronicles 11, verse 15 to 16. Okay, and we see a reference here. It says, now, three. Three of the thirty captains went down to the rock to David in the, into the cave of Abdullam, and the host of the Philistines encamped in the valley of Raphim. And David was then in the hole, and the Philistines' garrison was then in at Bethlehem. And, and so we see here that um, okay, they were encamped um, against, okay, they, against David. David was in a went actually went down, okay, and, and it was actually living in the cave during this time. Right? It was very difficult for the Philistines to attack in that position. Um, and, and so the question is this, what do we do? Right? David cannot just sit there okay, for a long extended period of time and then just hope that everything's going to be fine. Okay? And so what do we see? We see that David was asking for God's plan. Verse 19. And David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up to the Philistines? Will thou deliver them into mine hand? And the Lord said unto David, Go up, for I will doubtless deliver the Philistines into thine hand. And so here we see, right, he inquires, Do I go? Do I attack them? You know, Lord, are you going to deliver them into my hand? And then the Lord gave an answer. Now, the, in considering this decision, now we, once again, we see over and over again in uh, these passages, uh, we've dealt with this a number of times about decision-making. Now, every one of us needs to make decisions in our lives. Right? Any fool can make a choice or decision. But how many of us are going to decide wisely according to God's counsel and according to the will of God. Now, the pragmatic and obvious answer is this. David is not going to stand a chance. That's why he's already up in a defensive stronghold, up in the mountains, in a cave, right? It's undoubtedly going to be the fact that he's outnumbered, right? So, there's no, basically, it's forget about it, right? How on earth are you going to mount an attack? It's not going to work, David. Just give it up. Okay, but that is the obvious, the pragmatic answer. You, it is the human point of view, the humanistic point of view. Right? It is the secular point of view. It is the point of view based on the fact that, based on the idea of fantasy that we live in a world where God is not present. But the faith position is going to be that we live in a world where God still operates and still functions even in the realm of human, humankind, right? Where he exists, where he is powerful, right? He is, and, and, and there is the good and perfect will of God. Okay, and so David takes this second position, right? Whereas this is what happens, right? Many times 
when faced with overwhelming odds, when faced with difficulty, okay, churches, God's people tend to lean towards their own understanding, right? They choose the way of pragmatism, right? And pragmatism, by the way, is a very toxic, okay, very, very dangerous, very toxic way of thinking that basically says whatever works for me must be good, right? Never mind what God thinks, okay? He's, we're not even going to ask him. He's, we're not inviting him into the decision, right? Whatever works for us, therefore, must be good. And so, this is no different from uh, <coughs> what we saw in the book of Judges, where every man doeth with that which is right in his own eyes. Now, when, whenever we operate based on what is right in our own eyes, you can be sure of one thing. The majority of the time, it's going to be wrong in God's eyes. Now, so he seeks the position, right? He wants to know, what does God think? Right? The faith position goes like this. I will ask God what he thinks rather than go based on what I think or what the people around me think. And there is also the scriptural position. How so? Well, you go back to right, the first five books of the Bible, right? The law of Moses, right? The Pentateuch, now the, the, the Jews call that the Torah. The first five books of the Old Testament. Now, ask ourselves this question. How many of Israel's battles in the past were fought when they were grossly outnumbered? Many times, right? Miller's been going through the gate okay, to Joshua, right? On Saturdays with the young people. And over and over again, you see progressively the battles actually got larger and larger, right? To the point that instead of fighting one enemy, they gang up, right? I think it was about five different nations against Israel. Grossly outnumbered. And over and over again, God promised his victory. Okay? And in particular, God did make specific promises to the nation of Israel. All right, look at Leviticus chapter 26, verse 6 to 9. And I will give peace in the land, and ye shall lie down, and none shall make you afraid. Okay, none shall make you afraid. That means you're going to live in uh, peace and security, right, and, and without fear. And I will rid evil beasts out of the land. Right, so imagine most, most places, if you want to, live and colonize the place and whatever, um, you need to, you know, get rid of all the wild animals, right? Even Singapore, once upon a time, had tigers. Okay, now they're gone. Is it, Neither shall the sword go through your land. And ye shall chase your enemies. Now look at this promise. Ye shall chase your enemies and they shall fall before you by the sword. Okay, that, that, there is a promise of victory. And it says, and five of you shall chase a hundred. Okay, five against a hundred. So there's 20 to 1 ratio. And yet they are the ones, okay, chasing the enemies. And it says, and they shall fall before you by the sword. Now verse 8, and, um, sorry, and verse 8, right? It says, you chase a hundred, and a hundred of you shall put 10,000 to flight. Okay? 10,000 to flight. And it says, and your enemy shall fall before you by the sword. For I will have respect unto you, and make you fruitful, and multiply you, and establish my covenant with you. Now, again, this is a promise that God made to Israel as a nation. All right, look at other promises that God made. Exodus 14, verse 14. All right, when they were about to cross the Red Sea, said, the Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. All right, Exodus 23, verse 27. I will send fear before thee, and I and will destroy all the people to whom thou shalt come, and I will make all thine enemies turn their backs unto thee. So notice, even as Israel advances and moves right uh, across the wilderness and then into the promised land, now God says he's going to send fear. Right? This invisible thing is not, you know, not every battle needs to be won by, you know, just overwhelming force and, an, and a military. So God sends fear to the point it, says it will destroy them, right? They will, they will turn their backs to Israel. They will run. Okay. Deuteronomy 3 verse 23, He shall not fear them, for the Lord your God, he shall fight for you. 
Right, Psalm 35, verse 1. Plead my cause, O Lord, with them that strive with me. Fight against them that fight against me. And you know, what a comfort it is now. Even in Psalm 35, David personally pleads with God. Right, and God answers his prayer. You know, and he says, so fight against them that fight against me. Now, we don't get to choose whether or not we have enemies. There are always going to be people that will choose to make themselves an enemy to you. All right? Now, we, we don't have to become their enemy. But and as much as possible, we try to live peaceably with all men. But sometimes this is going to happen. And the question here is going to be this. Will we let the Lord fight the battles for us? Okay, because that's a choice and a decision you and I have to make. All right, Romans 8.31, what shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Okay, who's going to stand against us if God is for us? Now, that only works provided you and I are walking in the will of the Lord. All right? Now, what many people try to do, and they misuse this passage in Romans 8.31, is that, like, well, this is the way, this is the path that I have chosen. All right? I'm going to go this way. Whether or not I, uh, I sought the counsel of the Lord, that's irrelevant. I, I um, presumptuously want to go this way, and I'm going to hold this verse all right, such that God has no choice, but he's got to back me up. That's not how it works. Okay, it doesn't work that way. Okay, but here, remember, all things work together for good for them who love the Lord, who are them, them who are called according to his purpose. All right, are you and I walking in the way of the Lord? Are you and I walking in his will? Okay, he, the, the, those passages are not meant to be twisted such that um, we turn God into some sort of genie that is there to just obey everything that we sovereignly decided to do because it's the other way around. And here, David asks for counsel what to do. Should I attack or should I just stay here and, you know, write this thing out? And so, now, there are a lot of things that are tied to this because how this decision is going to be made is not just something that affects David. It's going to affect all the men the whole nation, right? And the, the enemy now has come out in overwhelming force. Okay, so everyone is looking at David with the expectation, please do something. All right? But I think it's important to realize, right, as a spiritual leader, okay, whether it's king, as a pastor, you know, uh, uh, as a, someone in leadership in, the, in church, or as a husband, or as a father, for instance, or as a parent, Right, as a mother. Now, I think the people who are looking to us need to be able to see that we are looking to the Lord. We are seeking the Lord. We are seeking his plan, not just doing what comes conveniently to us or what works for us. Okay, Because here's one of the problems. Many times, uh, children are growing up in a, a so-called Christian home, right? But what they're seeing is mom and dad just doing whatever works for them. Right, making the decisions right. Uh, Sunday, yes, we we hear God's word, we hear all these principles, but when it when push comes to shove, right, when we really have to make a decision, what happens? The children see us doing something else, doing whatever comes convenient, right, whatever is expedient to us, and what they're going to be seeing and what is being demonstrated is not of faith, okay, but it's something else. And you and I need to realize it's not just um, it's not just about offending God, but the fact is that we, we're pushing away. It is a terrible testimony, right, to the children. It is a it, it you know it it tells them you know we don't really believe all this, right, and that we have our own way of de dealing with things, and they're going to see this crazy contradiction all the time. Okay, now, David is seeking the plan. And so here, he had instructions to assault, right? Baal Perizim, right? Look, look at verse 20. And having received instructions, it says here, 
And David came to Baal Barazim, and David smote them there and said, The Lord had broken forth upon my enemies before me as the breach of waters. Therefore, he called the name of that place Baal Barazim. Okay, and so here, this name, right, Baal Barazim, okay, Basically, when you look at look up the name, it means Lord of the Bricks, right? Or, okay, as in, and here it says Possessor of Breaches. Okay, this, this place is known as the Plain of Breaches. Okay, this, this plain. Now, it almost looks like David is making fun of Baal because he's the Lord of the Harvest and yet God made a breach on the Philistines such that it's almost, it, 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 it the name pictures this, right? It's like a, a dam that bursts and the waters and the floods just come gushing out suddenly, right? And then basically sweeping everything in this path. Okay, and, and the idea here was what? The Lord broke forth, right? Just like water breaking forth, breaching through a wall, right? And then sweeping all the enemies of David. It says, the Lord had broken forth upon mine enemies before me as the breach of waters. And so basically it swept and took all of them away, right? Swift and sudden destruction upon the Philistines. And there was nothing left. Okay, now look at Isaiah 28 verse 21 to 22. For the Lord shall rise up as in Mount Perazim. He shall be wroth as in the valley of Gibeon, that he may do his work, his strange work, and to bring to pass his act. His strange act. Now, therefore, be ye not mockers, lest your bands be made strong. All right, for I have heard from the Lord God of hosts a consumption, even determined upon the whole earth. And so, here, okay, in Isaiah 28, it talks about how the Lord, once again, is going to do what he did on, at, uh, on Mount Perazim. Okay, and then just the Lord just breaking forth. Okay, and then destroying now. In all this, you're going to see David, even in his military tactics, okay, is actually dependent on the Lord. Okay, the Lord guides him in terms of what needs to be done. And, and you know, many times if you and I, you know, really just pay attention to the word of God, you can see sometimes the things that happen are happening to us that we can find counsel even from the scriptures. Now, at times in the past, I, I just had to look at, you know, what happened, uh, how things played out, let's say, in the life of David, you know, and, I, and the Lord directed me to how to deal with things from that point. And, you know, and basically leaving it to the Lord to deal with the battle. And, you know, it works out. And, and when it works out, people get mad at me. You know, they will even accuse me of, uh, you know, um, using political tactics, which I didn't. I just followed, okay, scriptural examples. But they get very mad and sore. Now, you're going to see here, David was dependent on the Lord to direct him as to what to do. And as they attacked this place, right, and they had a, an overwhelming victory against right, all odds, right, a, a um, force, okay, a military that was much larger and mightier than them. And then, because of that, we see the annihilation of the idols. Verse 21, And there they left their images, and David and his men burned them. Okay, verse 21. Now, Deuteronomy 7, verse 25 and 26, says, The graven images of their gods shall ye burn with fire. All right, those were the instructions to Israel. So thou shalt not desire the silver or gold that is on them, nor take it unto thee, lest thou be snared therein. You know, the, the point here was, he, he, you know, God told Israel, when you find these graven images, right, of their idols, their gods, burn all of them with fire. Don't even think about recycling this. Right now, many times this is what happens. Hey, okay, the pragmatic decision is, wow, there's so much valuable gold, so much valuable silver. Why don't we just melt all this down, right? We can resell this. Uh, it's worth a lot of money. You know, after all, when we have money, we can do much work in the, in, in the name of the Lord, right? You know, I'm sure our, our mission's budget, our general fund can benefit from this. You know, if, if, if it's based on that kind of logic, 
okay, it will dictate that, you know, for, for some folks, after they got saved, oh, look, let's just go sell all the, um, all the alcohol that we have. Right, sell this stuff and whatever, get back the money, and then we can always give it, right? We can always give it to the church, right? We can always give it to a, the general fund or the missions fund. Now, God says what? You don't even desire this stuff, right? Don't take it to you. Why? The risk is this. Now, the reason for this is it, it's not just a physical object. There, there, there is something spiritual about it also. And it acknowledges there is also the constant temptation that comes from within, lest thou be snared therein, for it is, notice, an abomination to the Lord thy God. Now, that ought to be enough for us. If it's an abomination to God, right? It offends God. Then I think that ought to settle the argument for us. You know what? Don't have anything to do with it. Right? Destroy them. Now, it says, Neither shalt thou bring an abomination into thine house, lest thou be, an, be a cursed thing like it. But thou shalt utterly detest it. Thou shalt utterly abhor it. Why? Right? For it is a cursed thing. And if God has cursed something, why are we even embracing it or, or flirting with it? Okay, so David and his men were very resolved about this. They encountered these, right, these images, these idols. Now, remember, these gods that they made out of gold and silver and whatever didn't help them when David and his men attacked. Okay, even though they outnumbered David and his men, what happened? Those gods were not able to rescue them. And so this was a resounding defeat, right? And what is, I think, more embarrassing is the fact that here is a god that, you know something, the Philistines cannot see, right? Now, the world looks at God and says, you know, we want a god that we can see. That's why they have idols, okay? But here is Jehovah, right, who they cannot see, the God of Israel, and yet, you know, he's able to defeat them in, in such a conclusive manner that, you know, there's nothing left to debate. Now, we're going to see that, well, that's round one. It's not over yet. Because then now we see the action at Raphaim. Look at verse 22. And the Philistines came right up yet again you notice this, this is the second time and spread themselves in the valley of Raphim. and there's going to be action again there's going to be a battle and we see the alternative plan from god look at verse 23 and 24 and when david inquired of the lord he said thou shalt not go up now this time around remember the first time david asked shall i go yes or no the lord said go Right, go and attack. I will deliver them. Now this time around, you know, you're going to notice whether by the foreknowledge of God, okay, or by just God's divine plan. Now the Lord tells David, "Don't go up directly." Now the point here is, you know, it says, "But fetch a compass behind them and come upon them over against the mulberry trees." Now. It's very interesting because what the Lord is telling David is this. Don't do a direct attack. Okay? Instead, flank around, go to the back of the enemy, attack them from behind. Right? He tells them of... He, now, remember, David doesn't have a drone or satellites going above, right? Or you know, to, to do surveillance on the place. You Note know, this something here, verse 23, God is omnipresent, right? And he is omniscient. That means he knows all, he's everywhere, and he knows the, the terrain. He knows that, okay, here's this place where they are camped. This is how the enemy is laid out. But then there is a group, right? A bunch of mulberry trees growing. And... Hey, it says you you what you do is, is fetch a compass behind them. So sneak around, go, turn 
over to the behind and attack them from behind. All right? And the location will be, you will come up against these group of trees. And what will be the signal for the attack? Notice verse 24. And let it be when thou hearest the sound of a going in the tops of the mulberry trees, that thou shalt bestir thyself. Now it says, when they go there, it says you're going to hear a certain sound. Right? And this sound is coming from the tops of the trees. And when you hear that sound, what happens? Move. Attack. For then shall the Lord go out before thee to smite the host of the Philistines. And again, you see a promise here that the Lord is going to be the one that's going to go out there, right? It's going to attack. He's going to smite the Philistines. So this was a different plan. Okay, the Lord will go out. This will be a first strike. Okay. Now, many times in modern warfare, we will have, we will call for, you know, an airstrike and artillery, soften the target first before uh, the soldiers will do the attack. Now here the Lord says uh, he will be the one to go out and basically whack everybody, right? Before Israel, actually, the men of Israel actually attacks. Okay? And so this was an alternative plan. This is a different plan. Now, this is not going to work unless you and I, right, just like David, are prepared to allow God to overrule our plans. Okay, now, because David in making this decision, he's going to face up to the senior commanders who are under him, right? The generals, right? Joab and others. Now, they're going to say, hey, wait, 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 but what kind of plan is that? You know, where do you get this thing from? How do you know there are mulberry trees there? You, you didn't even go out there you know, our scouts didn't uh, report anything. How do you know? God told me so. All right, I know because right, God convicted me about this. God, the Lord revealed this to me. Now, he's going to have to overrule all this because for those who don't understand, right, those who have no idea of how God works, and, and, and as a, you know, in, in spiritual leadership, many times we're going to see that, that when we encounter there are folks who have never okay, seen firsthand, never trusted the Lord to direct their way, okay, they're going to argue with you about this. They say, how do you know? How can you be so sure? You know, are you crazy? You know, don't you know how risky that is? And, and so on and so forth. And yet, what happened was this, David was willing, right? As much as they, he and his uh, commanders sat down, right? They would have laid out a battle plan. God showed him an alternative, right? And David was prepared to allow God to rewrite his plans. Now, I wonder how many of us are agreeable, right, to the Lord's leading because it could mean God's going to totally rewrite your plan. Here it says, and David did so, verse 25, as the Lord had commanded him and smote the Philistines from Geba until thou come to Gaza. Okay. God's plan is best. His way is perfect. Right? 2 Samuel 23, verse 31 to 33. As for God, his way is perfect. Right? The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler, not as a shield, said to all them that trust in him. For who is God save the Lord? And who is a rock save our God? God is my strength and power. He maketh my way perfect. Right? He makes my way perfect. Why? Because his way is perfect. And now, the question for us is this. Will we trust God even when we don't understand what's going on? Even when we don't understand why? Okay? This is the same thing uh, uh, over the years we, when the, cho my, the children were much younger. In part of the training and teaching, I wanted them to be able to obey an instruction and commandment, even if they don't understand why. Why? Because when it comes to, it's not so much that, I, okay, uh, I just want them to obey me unconditionally. Right now, realize as mom and dad, we have a job to do, which is training and preparing our children that someday 
this is how they should obey the Lord. Okay, and and that requires practice, right? And and it, it, we train them by in terms of how they obey us now. And, and there will be times I I told I told the kids. Okay, when it comes to the issue of safety, whatever. Now I'm I'm if I issue an instruction, just do it. It's not the time to negotiate. I can explain to you later, but I don't always have the time to explain to you why right now. And sometimes we don't always understand why. But there has to be that trust. Okay, that trust, and it comes from okay, a caring and loving relationship. That you know, um, you know, mom and dad love you. We want the best for you. And sometimes we're going to make decisions that are not popular. Okay. Now, again, this is not just about, it's not about us. It's about, I, we want to prepare them that someday they, can't, they turn to the Lord with that kind of trust. All right? That they, but you see, the thing is this, mom and dad, we can teach and say this with our mouth, but they're going to have to see also that we live out our lives that way. We're going to trust the Lord, right? When, when the money is tight, right? When we have uh, finan- important and big financial decisions to make, where the way forward in the future is uncertain, you know, what, what are we going to do? You know, here, how to fight the battle, right? Which way to go? Now, are we going to trust the Lord with this or we're going to figure things out on our own? Now, that's still a choice and decision we have to make, right? And, and so realize this, that um, David, very early on, even as a king, demonstrated his willingness that you know, God can veto any plan. Okay, over the years, right, as pastor, I've, I've actually faced this situation that we pray about this, we make plans, whatever, but God can always rewrite the plans. God can veto anything. All right, and, and we, but we has to be settled in our hearts that we want to give him permission to do that, to take over. Right? And if he re- rewrites the plan, so be it. Okay? Because it's going to happen. Right? Um, preachers will know this. Okay? Because we can develop a sermon. Okay? We have all this stuff. And then uh, and I've been in situations, right? On a Sunday morning, I get out of the car. We're still in the parking lot. We have not arrived in church yet. And it became very clear. Right, the Lord convicts me in the heart. Said, "Don't preach this message that you prepared. I want you to preach something else." All right, and then He directs me to okay a a a chapter and says, "From here, preach from this without your notes." Now, I thought maybe well it happened to me once, you know. I I, but then I I discover later that there were other preachers that the Lord convicted them in that way. Now, and, and it's very telling because they, they, they responded. All right, they surrendered. They said, okay, if that's what you want, Lord, I'll do it. All right, it, it may be uh, uh, frightening. All right, I mean, who wants to get up on Sunday morning and, and uh, basically we don't have notes. All right, we have nothing prepared. We have this chapter with the text and that's all we have. But, you know, as many as are led by the Spirit of the Lord, all right, of God, they are the sons of God. And God is able to lead and direct us, okay, especially as New Testament saints. And here, even without the indwelling Holy Spirit of God, now David was continually allowing God right, to lead and direct and to veto and to change direction as a leader. Now, he was not afraid that, oh, I changed my mind. That's going to make me look weak in front of all the men. Right, it's going to make me look indecisive. Right? Uh, it's going to make me look like whimsical. No. When the Lord has spoken, you know, he, he, it settles his resolve. And so he makes a way forward. Now, um, remember Abraham? <coughs> and Abraham came home one day, right? <coughs> Tells his wife, pack up, we're moving. Now, <coughs> to make that decision, 
there are it raises more <coughs> questions and answers. And yet, by faith, he was willing to go forward, trust the Lord, right, with the decision. Now, sometimes we have those around us, family members, um, a spouse that may not understand. I think what needs to be clear is this. They need to see that we are prepared to follow the Lord and obey at all costs. Okay? I've shared this before. You know, even with Janice and I, now it wasn't always uh, smooth going in the earlier years. Right? And a lot of that's my fault. Okay? Because I was very self-willed. It caused a lot of, uh, you know, anxiety, concern. But one of the things that was a turning point in change was where, as she saw the Lord dealing with me, right? And, and that the more that I was just trusting God, right? And, and allowing Him to rule in my life. Now, what changed in our relationship was she was able to also trust me. Why? Because she saw me trusting God's leadership. You see, the lead, you know, true spiritual lead, leadership is not about us, but what we do. It is about our surrender and who we are following. And, and whether it's as, a, uh, uh, as parents, right, or as a husband, okay, or as men in the church or as a pastor, now people need to be seeing that we, <clears throat> every step of the way, in small things and large things, and, and you know, we need to practice with the small decisions and things. You know, to trust the Lord, right, if, in all that we do. And to leave the outcome to Him, right, what's going to happen, you know, uh, if we do this, whatever, you know, are we going to have enough money left? You know, what happens if uh, we run out? You know, what happens? You know, who's going to take care of this? And, you know, and we're going to have to trust God with this. Right? And as we do that, I think what's going to happen is this. People around us are going to see that this is what we're doing. Right? And if they, you know, if they know the Lord, it's going to also inspire confidence. Okay? The confidence is not in us being fearless. Right? Or being uh, dynamic and charismatic. It's about us being surrendered. Okay? Walking in faith. And so, tonight as we close, I want, us to, I want us to consider this question, right? How surrendered are we? Because in all these decisions, right, David allowed God to rewrite the plans. Now, you and I may have plans. You and I have, may have decisions, right? All sorts. It could be, a, you know, whether to take this job, you know, whether to move somewhere, whether to, uh, you know, maybe sell the home, whether to... You know, things that we have to do concerning the work of the ministry, right? Who to marry, and so on and so forth. Now, there are a lot of de decisions, but the question is this who tonight will allow God to say, you know, Father, we, I have this decision. This is important to me, right? Uh, there are all sorts of uh, important consequences, but I'm going to trust you with the outcome. I'm going to trust you also with the decision. Will you show us, right? Show me what we, I need to do. Will you lead and direct me? Right? Will you show me your thy good and perfect way? Right? Because as for God, his way is perfect. Right? He doesn't make mistakes. But make it very clear that I know, right? That, that is, it is in, under, in no uncertain terms. Right? And that, that and we can move forward. Right? And will, will you trust him with that? And, and instead of uh, leaning to our own understanding, because it will make a difference in terms of the result of our decision and choice. It will show in how we do things, right? It will show in our decisions. It will show in our priorities, right? Will we do that? Okay, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time in the Word.